colloquium 2020 organized by Department of Pharmaceutical Technology, Department of Biotechnology, and Department of the GIS University. Thank you so much that you guys are with us till today. This three days you are with us. Thank you so much. It's really appreciated. Uh, without wasting our time, I would like to move on to our session. We are having plenary session today, and uh, our guest speaker, respected guest, Professor B. Narasimhan, is with us. Before Sir starts his presentation, I would like to give a brief introduction about him. The professor Dr. B. Narasimhan is the Dean of the Faculty and Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Maharshi Dayanand University, Rochester, India. He has been the lecturer of CK College of Pharmacy, NIEC Lucknow, Guru Dambeshwar University of Science and Technology, and many others. He has more than 120 peer-reviewed publications on various reputed national and international journals. And he had been a presenter for more than 60 pharmaceutical presentation, published abstracts, and papers on various conferences of Indian Pharmaceutical Congress, AICT-sponsored seminars, IPGA national conventions, etc. He has a few books and chapters published by his name. He had been honored with a prestigious award like Best Pharmaceutical Scientist, ATP Young Scientist Award by various organizations. He's, the editor, he's in the editorial board member of reputed journals. He's also a member of many academic bodies and academic activities as well. He has been a convener, evaluator, committee member in different national and international conferences. He has supervised a lot of M farm and doctoral projects as well. He had completed his B farm from College of Pharmacy, SRI, CMS, Coimbatore, he had qualified GET and did his M farm from NDMVPS College of Pharmacy, Nasik, and he pursued his PhD from Guru Jambeshwar University of Science and Technology. So this was the introduction about our respected speaker, Dr. B. Narsimhan, and he's with us right now. So I would like to request uh, to proceed for his presentation. And before that, I would like to request all the participants that please put yourself in the mute mode that our speaker can present his presentation without any obstacles. So the floor is all yours. Yeah. Thank you. I, am I audible? Yes, sir. You're absolutely audible, uh, sir. Okay. Just I will start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to do the presentation on uh, computer aided drug design. Sir, is there a problem? It is visible now? Uh, no, sir, not, not yet. yet sir. Achha, yes, at, at the bottom, there is a screen sharing option. Achha, yes, we can see you, but not your screen. Okay. If you're operating from a laptop at the bottom of the screen, yes, there is I am operating from uh, mobile. Yeah, mobile, uh, then also you'll get it, sir. Share screen I, option. Sir, actually, it is showing uh, Google Meet. Just I can you uh, let me out first? Yeah. Can you uh, it, leave me it's, out? It's, Aap exit kar do, exit kar do, dobara, uh, sign in. Kar do. Okay, sir. So, okay. okay.
सोमन लो कॉपी सोमन लो प्लीज प्ले द म्यूजिक Uh, professor Martin yes Kapoor. doctor yeah uh, 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 do not exit anyone from your part because if twice you will do this he cannot able to enter okay, okay. copy copy sir कार सतनाम करता पूरख निजप निज वैर अकाल मूरत अजुनी सैभम गुरु प्रसाद जप आद सच जुगाद सच है भी सच नानक हो से भी सच वी नो दैट एज वी ग्रो द हर्डल्स विल बी मोर ईच टाइम वी आर वॉश्ड अवे वी बाउंस बैक टू द शोर वी नो वी लीड द वे कीपिंग ऑन्स अप पे See the sunrise tomorrow and fly the world to follow शाइनिंग ब्राइट इवन इन द डार्कस्ट नाइट इग्नाइटिंग माइंड एम्पावरिंग लाइफ विद इन अस टू मारो प्राइस We have what it takes to win and achieve what we dream. We can calm a stormy sea. Our courage echoes eternally. Our words to the earth's mouth. Our seed is eternal. सतनाम करता पूरख निज पौ निज वैर अकाल मूरत अजुनी सैभम गुरु प्रसाद जप आद सच जुगाद सच है भी सच 
नानक हुसे भी सच know that as we grow the hurdles will be more each time we are washed away we bounce back to the shore we know we lead the way keeping odds at bay see the sunrise tomorrow and try the world to follow the darkest night igniting minds empowering lives within us tomorrow thrives we have what it takes to win and achieve what we dream we can calm a stormy sea our courage echoes eternally our wings will lead us tomorrow of the एक ओंकार सतनाम करता पूरख निज पौ निज वैर अकाल मूरत अजुनी से भंग गुरु प्रसाद जप आद सच जुगाद सच है भी सच नानक हुसे भी सच वी नो दैट एज वी ग्रो द हर्डल्स विल बी मोर ईच टाइम वी आर वॉश्ड अवे वी बाउंस बैक टू द शोर वी नो वी लीड द वे कीपिंग ऑड्स एट बे See the sunrise tomorrow and try the world to follow
shining bright, even in the darkest night. Igniting minds, empowering lives, within us tomorrow thrives. We have what it takes to win and achieve what we dream. We can calm a stormy sea, our courage echoes eternally. Dear participants, our speaker is having a problem in joining. Somehow he left. Please bear with us for a few minutes. Satnam karta purak nij paon nij ver akar murat mail id yeah yeah I, I have already already asked him to join in from Guru different mail id and from different device also as he was joining from iphone that was the issue sach, okay bhi sach nanak ho se bhi we know that as we grow the hurdles will be more each time we are washed away we bounce back to the shore we know we lead the way keeping odds at bay to see the sunrise tomorrow and fire the world to fire bright even in the darkest night igniting minds empowering lives within us tomorrow thrives we have what it takes to win and achieve what we dream we can calm a stormy sea our courage echoes eternally
Pedestrian Detri. Wait. How can you connect a video? I can video as you. What is the Should we video take a good part? Baki le khablo ke muche dohala. Somale copy. Yes, sir. I'm sharing my screen. I have shared already. Okay. Carry on. Ekum kaj satna karta It's okay, sir. Need you for need you where sound is good. Ajuni se bhang. Sound of okay. Good Persad Jap Ad Sach Jugad Sach Hebhi Sach Nanak Husi Bhi Sach We know that as we grow the hurdles will be more each time we are washed away, we bounce back to the shore. We know we lead the way, keeping odds at bay. See the sunrise tomorrow, inspire the world to follow. darkest night, igniting minds, empowering lives, within us tomorrow thrives, we have what it takes to win, and achieve what we dream, we can calm a stormy sea, our courage echoes eternally, our
एकोंकार सतनाम करता पूरक निज पौ निज वैर अकाल मूरत अजुनी सैभम गुरु प्रसाद जप आद सच जुगाद सच है भी सच नानक हो से भी सच We grow, the hurdles will be more. Each time we are washed away, we bounce back to the shore. We know we lead the way, keeping odds at bay. See the sunrise tomorrow, inspire the world to follow. Coffee, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, our second speaker is ready and uh, he is in. Okay. We we will immediately let me unmute him. Yes. Good morning, Sandeepan. Good morning, Dr. Sandeepan. Yeah. Good morning. So we are ready to go. Yeah. Just one second. Yeah. I'm just uh, my video is just coming up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Doctor? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah, please continue with sure. Dr. Sandeepan. Sure, sure, sir. Good morning, Dr. Sandeepan. Thank you so much for joining with us. And thank you so much all of the participants that with a uh, you are with us due to this inconvenience. And thank you so much for that. So our second speaker for our plenary session two of this day is with us right now. So uh, I would like to give a brief introduction about him as well. So Dr. Shonipan Vatacharji is currently the assistant professor from the Department of Pharmacy Practice and Science, the University of Arizona, USA. He had joined Lupin Limited as a marketing trainee, and later he secured a position of marketing executive there. He had worked as a student intern in GSK, Philadelphia, USA, before he joined the University of Arizona, USA. He is an experienced health economics and outcome researcher with extensive hands-on experience in diverse research projects involving pharmacy and administrative claims data, national healthcare survey data, electronic medical records, that is EMR records, pharmacoeconomic modeling meta-analysis, etc. He has more than 40 peer-reviewed publications on various reputed national and international journals. He had been invited for podium presentation in many international conferences. He had been a presenter for more than 70 scientific presentations and published abstracts on various international conferences. He has been honored with various awards by ISPOR, that is International Society of Pharmacoeconomics and Outcome Research, and other international organizations. He had also served as a grant reviewer for local, international, and national organizations. He had successfully secured a highly competitive and prestigious peer reviewed external grants and grants from various pharmaceutical companies as principal investigator. He had completed his BPharm from Jadavpur University, Kolkata, India, and had done his MS in Pharmacy Administration from University of Western Texas, USA. He had earned his PhD in Pharmaceutical System and Policy from West Virginia University, USA. So this was a very brief enlightenment on the professional and educational tour of Dr. Shonipan Bhattacharji, and we are really very privileged to have him amongst us as a speaker. So, sir, the floor is all yours. Please proceed for your presentation. Okay. 
Uh, first of all, uh, Shakshar, Shakhar, uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I really don't think that was uh, like a brief, my pleasure, sir. pretty much my summary. But uh, so, but I'm very privileged, honored, uh, and happy to be here with you all. And I think uh, that you guys have put together a great uh, e-conference and it's very applaudable. So I congratulate every one of you, you in the organizing committee. And um, so one thing before I start my presentation today, I just wanted to mention something that, you know, unfortunately there has been some issues with my laptop. You know, we faced that last time as well. It hasn't been resolved. So after like 30 minutes or so, my uh, system on the zoom system starts acting up. So if that happens, I will just drop off and join back in. And I apologize, um, upfront for that uh, inconvenience if that happens. So just, uh, just so that everyone knows about that. Okay. So having said that, okay. let me yeah. show you my screen. Are you all able to see it? Yes, yeah, okay, so today we are going to talk about real world evidence and please note that, you know, in, in some cases um, in the Indian context, this may be somewhat of a new concept. So if there are any questions or anything like that, I'm happy to take uh, those as we go on or it can wait until uh, the end of my presentation, whichever way. So uh, the outline of today's presentation is that first we'll try to understand what is real world evidence and why is it important. Next, we'll talk about the sources of real world evidence, which include, and we will primarily focus on pragmatic trials and observational studies. Then we'll talk about how to mitigate the risk of bias that are, happens in different types of observational studies. And then finally, we'll see like, how do we evaluate the observational studies from where we get this real world evidence. So first, uh, what is um, uh, RWE and why is it important? Now, please note that there are certain acronyms which we uh, use very frequently in our field. And the couple of uh, those acronyms that we will talk about are RWE and RWD. So we'll, we'll see like, you know, what that entails. So RWD is basically stands for real world data. Now it refers to the data that is routinely generated or collected in the course of healthcare delivery. And it is something that, I mean, it is a data that is collected outside of randomized control trials. Now, I, uh, I have, um, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with randomized control trials. Now, just to give you like a very brief overview. So randomized controlled trials are considered to be the gold standard evidence. So all the other types of study designs that are, uh, you know, that people conduct outside of clinical trials, it is kind of compared to the benchmark, which is RCT, mainly because it has a component of something called the randomization. Now, randomization is something that helps in taking care of, so let's say that there are two groups. There is group A, which is the treatment, and group B, which is the placebo. Now, once you randomize these two groups, they are, I mean, their characteristics are expected to be similar. And more importantly, you know, we cannot always, always measure all the different characteristics that are present in the different groups. There will be some unobservable characteristics. Now, the randomization, the very uh, unique thing about randomization is that it helps in uh, uh, reducing this or eliminating this uh, un unobserved differences between the two. That's why it is considered to be the best possible or the gold standard evidence. And you know, the real world data, but one of the drawbacks of RCTs is that it is very, it, it is not generalizable. It is applicable only to a few selected sam uh, study sample. Uh, but for real world data, it is much more applicable, much more generalizable because it is happening in the regular or the routinely uh, routine healthcare delivery system. Now, what are some of the examples of real world data? So there are many different sources of real world data. 
uh, electronic health records. I, I think it is uh, pretty prevalent in India as well. So for example, if you go to um, a hospital, you will see that most of the data that you enter about yourself, they, they convert it into an electronic format so that it gets stored there. So basically the digitization of your records, or health records is what it is about, the electronic health record. Now this is very unique and provides much more in-depth, uh, clinically rich data, uh, data get many different variables. It can have lab values. It can have certain types of uh, test scores and all those things. That is very, very uh, useful. The other type of data source, which is primarily used uh, in the United States is the administrative or claims data. So what happens is people who have insurance, so whenever they go to visit a doctor, uh, that gets recorded. And all the claims, you know, whatever the diagnosis was, whatever the medications that were prescribed and whatever the medication was filled from the pharmacy, all of those things get recorded within the uh, database of that insurance coverage, um, uh, insurance carrier. Now that is something what the researchers use to see, you know, how is the treatment pattern? What are the different outcomes that are happening with different treatment patterns? What is the cost associated with different uh, treatments or uh, different interventions? So this is what the administrative or claims database. So it is associated with certain insurance claims and it can be many different types of claims, Medicare claim, Medicaid claim, or any type of commercial claims. So, so there are many different sources. Uh, patient registries where, you know, uh, it's again, it's like collected from the patients themselves and it's very rich. It has many different information and all longitudinal information which can help in addressing certain important research questions which cannot be addressed in, uh, with uh, some other databases. The other data which we sometimes don't really think of is basically, you know, the patient generated uh, information such as diaries or questionnaires. So in certain cases, you can be uh, given a questionnaire and you fill them up. So for example, if you were given something called the PHQ-9 or the patient health questionnaire were nine or nine items. So it, it is actually looking into the depression. I mean, if you are depressed, and what is the level of de uh, the se uh, depression severity? So that is one example of questionnaire. There can be many different types of questionnaires that can be developed to generate patient information. Diaries, you know, it's very important if someone is, keeps a meticulous um, record of their daily activities or things like that. Diaries can be even considered like very, uh, like a gold a mine of information like you are noting down as it happened. So it reduces the uh, recall bias, but the flip side is you have to be very meticulous about keeping those records. Uh, smart devices. So there can be in-home monitoring devices or apps on the phone where you can monitor your blood pressure. You can look at how many steps you took, uh, your um, uh, physical activities and all. So they, they are very, very uh, uh, rich resources. And last but not the least are the social media. You know, I was attending, um, uh, uh, attending a sem um, um, seminar a few years back and people were talking that they use Twitter um, um, records to analyze um, at, or, you know, asthma attacks, right? So they, they I mean, it's, um, so what they do is they do data mining and look at, you know, how many, uh, hits they get where they mention something about uh, asthma attack. And then they clean the data and finally do the analysis. And they can even go into geographic regions to see how was the air quality that may lead to this kind of uh, accelerated or uh, more types of asthma attacks and all. So these are like really great resources. So these are some of the examples of your real world data. Now, what is real world evidence? Real world evidence are inferences derived from this real world data through the application of trusted scientific and statistical methods. Now, so for example, let's say that we have all these different databases. The question is, how can we ask a good question and apply very trusted scientific and rigorous statistical research methods 
to make sure that we answer the research question and it is of high quality very high scientific rigor so that the peer i mean all the people who is looking into it can trust it the healthcare providers can trust it uh, the patients can trust it caregivers can trust it so it's these are all the uh, information that is coming out from analyzing the real world data and inferring from them and this is what is called the real world evidence now please note that real world evidence is kind of a buzzword in our field right now it has gained significant a very high significant um 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 acceptability or you know interest um in this area of late and there has been many different reasons for that mainly because you know in our cities it can be very expensive there it's not even feasible sometimes to conduct rcts even though that is considered to be the gold standard so real world evidence is the best possible alternate source to get generate evidence for that now what are some of the benefits of real world evidence that is something that i would ask if i was um, trying to understand real world evidence so there are many different benefits first is we can conduct safety surveillance of medical products for example let's say a new drug which came into the market you know post market um, uh, sort of surveillance kind of thing so how that uh, uh, drug is doing in the real world after being approved uh, from the clinical trials how is that really um, happening um, I, i mean performing in the real world if there are certain uh, risk associated with taking that drug what are the safety concern what are the adverse events that can happen so we can all analyze the real world data to uh, look into the uh, safety aspect of the medication we can also see how the treatment patterns change over time for example you know for in terms of antipsychotics they used there used to be a first generation or typical antipsychotic and a second generation antipsychotic came in and they are called as atypical antipsychotic and the practice pattern there was many different uh, side effects associated with first generation antipsychotics so the treatment patterns kept on changing the uh, healthcare providers kept changing their um, treatment patterns so this is something that can be used or that can rather be um, uh, examined through the real world evidence or real world data it helps in drawing causal inferences or rather associations between drugs and treatment effects so for example what we can see, say is let's say that a patient who has depression is taking antidepressants right so the goal is to see if they have their depression symptoms reduced right so we can see how many depression free days they are experiencing and then you can see like you know uh, see if there is an association between the taking this antidepressant medication and this outcome or the treatment effect right so that's another important benefit of real world evidence moreover you know a real world uh, but the regulatory decision making uh, uh, by addressing questions that are not feasible as i was mentioning before right so there are certain questions or certain populations which cannot be included in your uh, randomized control trials due to ethical reasons and they are not feasible sometimes the sample size is so small you cannot really do anything so in those cases people need to rely or sometimes have to rely on this real world data and that is what is very important for the regulators or regulatory bodies or decision making bodies to come up with certain uh, decisions like okay we will approve this drug for this indication we'll uh, come up with a secondary approval thing for this uh, uh, medication kind of uh, concepts so this is where it is important um, uh, helpful now uh, we have already talked about this and then um, this one so how, what are the different types of um, so now that we know what is real world data and what is real world evidence and why is it important the question is you know what are the different statistical or the scientific design or study design that we can use to come up with this real world evidence right so they can be broadly classified you know and this is a very broad classification and again a disclaimer that i would like to make is that you know i am trying to squeeze in a lot of information within a one hour session so uh, 
you know, uh, uh, yeah. So there is a chance that you know I'm going to skip certain important parts because this can, this is usually like a whole course that we can talk about. So broadly speaking, it can be pragmatic clinical trials, not the usual traditional clinical trials. This is something different, pragmatic clinical trials. And we'll talk a little bit in detail on those things. Uh, and then observational studies, which can be uh, cohort study, prospective or retrospective cohort study, or case control studies. And we will go through each, uh, each different types of studies uh, in the next few slides. So the other question is real world evidence. Why do we need it? Now, patients are living longer, wanting the best health possible. So there was a report that came out in the American um, Stroke Association, uh, American Heart Association that mentioned that the mortality due to stroke has significantly decreased over time. Now the question is, okay, so let's say that the patients are living longer, but the most important question is, are they living a good life after they, are, they have survived the stroke? Are they able to move around? Are they able to lead a normal, kind of a normal life, right? So that's very important. The costs continue to rise and need to demonstrate the value to the payers. And this is from a, a very um, much US perspective because it is kind of regulated from a third party payer perspective. So an insurance company who is seeing that, okay, all our costs, you know, the medical cost, it keeps rising the, the cost uh, curve, if you look at that, it is it has been ever increasing. Now it is important to show the benefit of your product versus another uh, similar product to the payer to say, okay, we will pay for this high cost product, right? So that is very important. And that is being demonstrated by your real world evidence. And uh, regulatory agencies, they recognize the benefit of uh, RWE for regulatory decision makings for medicines and medical devices. And uh, I have been mentioned, uh, talking a lot about medicines, but medical devices, you know, they also rely a lot on the real world evidence as well. Uh, it, it's very broad, it, the application is enormous. So the regulatory agencies use them quite a bit. And very recently, there was a 21st Century Cures Act that came that required the uh, US uh, Food and Drug Administration to develop a framework and guidance for drug approvals using real world evidence. So usually, you know, when the first indication comes out is a randomized controlled trial that needs to demonstrate the uh, efficacy of the product. Now, when that product is on the market and you see that it has some beneficial effects and some secondary indication, you can use the real world evidence to make your case and FDA will listen to you. So that's why they have been paying more and more attention to this kind of real world studies. And that's why this RWE is becoming like a buzzword in our field uh, more recently, even though it has been there for a very long time. Now for pharmaceutical industry, they need real world studies to address effectiveness. They need to understand whether their drug is performing better than their competitors, how are their safety profiles, and if they have enough value addition to what, I mean, for their product. So all this comes from your RWE or real world evidence. Uh, so the payment or reimbursement models, they focus on value. Now, there is another term and please bear with me. I'm throwing out a lot of different terms at you guys, but you know, the value-based contracting or value-based reimbursement is becoming increasingly popular nowadays with the US third party payers. So until and unless you can show that, you know, the outcomes that are happening with your product is very much what you have claimed in your randomized control trial based on which the drug was approved, they are going to say that you need to share the cost with me, the pharmaceutical company, for the, so that the patient, if they don't benefit from that, as you have claimed, you need to share that risk. So there is a risk sharing. So you need to look at the value of the product, right? So this is where these are all very important, okay? So before I go into the different types of study design, I just wanted to ask to, uh, uh, to check in with you guys to see if everything sounds fine and do you have any particular question at this point? 
Yeah, you can write in the chat box. Uh, if it's okay, then you write why. Sandeepan, it's perfect. No, no problem okay. at all. Yeah, sounds okay. sounds are clear. You can continue. Okay, great. I can just continue then, and please, you know, let me know if any question pops up because I'm not able to see the chat box on my screen right now. Yeah, sure, sure. We we are keeping an eye, and this is on YouTube also. There are uh, many people are watching, so they are putting oh, questions. Oh, great. Also. Yeah. Okay. Please sounds continue. great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So how to generate the random, uh, the real world evidence, right? So there are different types of study design. Now study design is perhaps one of the key factors when we conduct our study, right? So one is the pragmatic control trial. Yesterday with Dr. Jason Horwitz, you guys were exposed to decision analysis. That also gives us a little bit of idea about the real world evidence. How cost effective is one drug compared to other? Or how cost effective is one medical device over another medical device? These are different questions that people can ask and answer with decision tree analysis, marker model, or Monte Carlo simulation. And we have the most commonly used, you know, kind of most commonly used study design or the observational designs. So for example, cohort studies, which includes prospective and retrospective case control studies, and some of the data sources like patient registries, electronic health records, they come in very handy to answer those kind of research questions. Okay, so let's go through uh, this different types of, we will focus mainly on the pragmatic controlled uh, clinical trials and the observational studies because decision analysis has already been covered in this uh, conference to, uh, to, uh, till date. So pragmatic trial. So before we start uh, the pragmatic trial, let me see, you know, let me ask this question. What characteristic of pragmatic trial is similar to explanatory or the traditional randomized control trials? Is it the study duration? Is it the component of randomization? Or is it the strict inclusion exclusion criteria? What do you guys think? And it's perfectly okay if you don't know because you know we haven't really discussed it, but your best guess. Okay, so guys, yeah, you can write that... in chat box. Yeah, someone says it's B. B randomization. B? Yeah. He or she is absolutely spot on. That is correct. It's a component of randomization that is different between uh, the, uh, uh, that is a characteristic which is actually not different, sorry, similar between randomized control trials, the traditional one, and the pragmatic control trials. Now, pragmatic control trials are very unique. It, it is, it provides perhaps the strongest evidence, you know, even though it's not considered to be the gold standard like ASCII's, but it does provide the strongest evidence because it combines the best of both worlds. It has all the good characteristics from the ran of the randomized control trials. And at the same time, it has the good characteristics or the advantages of observational studies. So, for example, this has a component of randomization, which provides very high internal validity. So we can say the scientific rigor is extremely high for this kind of studies. And uh, for observation study, it can be very well generalized. Like you can say that, okay, we conducted the study within this study, uh, study sample, but this can be superimposed or can be uh, uh, extrapolated to the entire study population. So if we hello yes, uh, your sound that problem has started. So. Oh, it started. Sorry about that. Yeah, let me let me drop off and I will join uh, right back in. Sure, sir. Thank you. Participant, please be with us. Our speaker will be joining us soon. He was having some problem with his laptop. That's why the sound problem was occurring. So he will be joining us. Please be with us.
Yeah, he joined with us. Yes. Okay, so can you uh, hear me better now? Yes, 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 absolutely. So, and your screen is also visible. Okay. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Um, so, I'm sorry about that, but okay. So, it com it has best of the both worlds, pragmatic clinical trials. It has high internal validity, and at the same time, it has high external validity. Now, some of the key points about pragmatic clinical trials, it is uh, we kind of look into the effectiveness of the uh, interventions. And that include the component of randomization in pragmatic clinical trials. The, uh, where is it conducted? It is conducted at the general practice settings. So for example, if there is a physician group where the people go for their regular checkup and everything, they are randomized. So, uh, you know, the uh, practice settings and all, it takes place at that level. So it helps to say that, okay, we have randomized it, but at the same time, please note that we are doing that with a regular clinic practice setting. So we are saying that whatever uh, findings we get, it can be generalized to the usual uh, population, not as restricted as the ra traditional randomized control trial. And uh, the study patients demographically is similar to general population, which is a huge advantage, external generalizability. Uh, and it compares active treatments provided by typical hospitals, outpatient settings and practitioners. So it doesn't compare to uh, like uh, the active treatment, I mean the treatment to uh, a placebo. It is compares the treatment A to treatment B. So there is active treatment comparison there. Now, I have said so many good things about pra pragmatic clinical science, but all the different studies, design, study designs, they have their own drawbacks, right? So what are the drawbacks of pra pragmatic clinical science? They are often restricted to measure easily estimated or adjudicated outcomes, some not really cost specific outcomes measures. Sometimes they will be very much, you know, focused on surrogate outcomes and stuff like that. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, just like that. The other are, uh, they are slow and can be extremely expensive. So that cost component is why you know we don't conduct as many pragmatic clinical trials as we should. The knowledge benefits, and they do not have the component of blinding, which is a clinical trial. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the uh, examples that I'm going to show, but this is just for your reference. In the New England Journal of Medicine, the study was published, and this is actually using, this is the promised trial. Uh, this is actually using um, the pragmatic control trial design, and they were looking into the outcomes of anatomical versus functional testing for coronary artery disease or CAD. So this is like, you know, you can understand just because it's published in any JM, the quality is extremely high and uh, we know it, it has very high acceptability. So that is what we have in terms of pragmatic con uh, con controlled trials for our uh, real world evidence. That's one way to generate real world evidence. Now we are going to talk about the observational studies that are used for uh, generating random um, real world evidence. So there are, I mean, in, uh, at first we'll talk about the two different types of cohort studies. One is the prospective cohort study and the other one is the retrospective cohort study. Now prospective, as the name suggests, it hasn't happened yet. So this is the, so this is the past, this is the present and this is the timeline, right? It is the future. So. I, as an investigator, I am here at the present time. And you see, like, you know, this is where you screen for all the existing illness. So at the very beginning of this study, you know, the outcome of interest should not be present. So if you are looking for, uh, uh, you know, uh, new metabolic disorders, at this time point, they should be free of any metabolic disorders. That's one of the key uh, uh, components of prospective cohort study. Then we will look something called the exposure 
or you can also call them treatment, but the better word is exposure. So we can compare the use of second generation antipsychotic to no use of second generation antipsychotic and then follow them for a certain period of time and see how many of these uh, people in this, who are using second generation antipsychotic develops new cases of metabolic disorder. And at the same time, the parallel, parallel time, we will follow up the patients who don't use the second generation antipsychotics, but develop the new cases of metabolic disorder in the future. So we are prospectively following them up. It's a longitudinal study design, right? So that's your prospective cohort study. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, mentioned before, so the cohort should be disease-free at the beginning of the study. Remember the timeline, you know, when you screen them, there should not be the disease state that we are interested in or the outcome that we are interested in. Same baseline information collected from all subjects in the same way. Always please remember that whenever we are conducting a cohort study, it is very important to look at the baseline info. So that is when the screening started. You know, what, what, the, what, the, uh, what their age is, uh, gender, race, ethnicity, um, what comorbidities did they have? Did they have any particular medication that they were using apart from the main thing that uh, main uh, medication that we are interested in? So these are all the different information that we need to collect from all the different study, study participants in the same way. And then obtain info, accurate information about exposures prior to the disease development in any of the subject. This is very important. Like when was the exposure, the time point where the exposure started and when the outcome finally developed later on. And I, as I said before, the patients are longitudinally followed over specified time period to determine if and when they contract the disease and whether the exposure status changes. So what can happen is some people who are not using the um, uh, antipsychotic at the beginning, they can start using them later on. So there is many different ways how the dynamics can go on and how you analyze them. So these are some very important concepts to keep in mind when you are uh, working your way through in this way. Uh, and some people who are using, started using antipsychotic, they may stop uh, using antipsychotic. There is an adherence problem right there. So many different things can happen as you move uh, forward in your timeline. Then uh, in terms of the, 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 it's important that the investigators can eventually use this data to answer many questions about the association between risk factors and disease outcomes. So this is very important. Like, you know, what is the treatment or the exposure and what is the outcome and how are they related or associated? And please note, that we cannot establish causality. We can only establish association with this kind of study design. That's why it is considered inferior to the traditional randomized control trials where you can actually establish cause effect relationship, right? The causal inference that can be established. So Having said all these things, what are the advantages and disadvantages of prospective cohort study? The advantages are that it indicate the temporal sequence between exposure and outcome, because you know we are going from one point to the other to the, to the future point, and we are trying to follow them up as completely as possible. So we know when, when the exposure started and when the outcome happened. Can evaluate multiple effects of a single exposure. So for example, for the antipsychotic exposure, we talked only about the metabolic disorders, but they can, uh, they can have um, mortality. You know, there is a risk of mortality with antipsychotic use in certain age groups and in different populations and all. So you can also look into mortality. That's another outcome that you can uh, look into. Hospitalization, that's another important real world outcome. So you can look into them as well. These are very efficient for rare exposures and outcomes with long induction and latency period. So. It is not something like, you know, it happens right away. It takes time for that uh, outcome to happen once you start using that particular medication. It doesn't happen like you start uh, getting those metabolic disorders right away. It needs maybe six months, maybe one year time, maybe five years time. So that long induction and latency period is where this kind of study design is very useful. However, 
the disadvantages of this kind of study is that it is expensive. And let me add, it's super expensive in many cases. Uh, it's time consuming. So you can think like, you know, if you are following them up for such a long time, you know, it's time consuming. And another important problem is loss to follow up or attrition bias that happens because as you move forward uh, in your uh, follow up, there are many people who will not show up. Many people will uh, pass away, die, or they may, they may move away for many different reasons. So you are not able to follow them up properly. You lo lose them. So these are some of the disadvantages of your prospective cohort study, right? So one example, and you can read this uh, uh, later on when I share the slides with you, but this nurse's health study, it, this is like a landmark study that started um, maybe in, um, started in 1976, right? And it has been going on since then. And if you look at the total cost, that was, uh, I mean, all the funds that were put into the nurses health study one, two, three and all, it is close to $625 million. So you can understand like how enormous amount of time, resource and everything is being invested. But the outcomes, all the different questions that you can answer through this uh, nurses health study is golden. Like it's huge. I mean, it gives us so many different new hypotheses, so many new direction addies and all. So it's very useful. So that's why, you know, the funding agencies keep, kept funding them for such a long time. And they added new uh, survey items and new um, quality items and everything over time. So it's, it's huge. The nurses, it's a um, landmark study. Okay, so that was about your prospective cohort study. The mo one of the perhaps the most commonly used um, study design when we, I mean, at least I do my study, I, I use a lot of retrospective cohort study where you are here, where this is your present, right? This is you as an investigator, you are here. And all the things that you are trying to understand and uh, I, I established an association for has already happened. So you are retrospectively looking at it. It has already happened. So for example, let's say that between January 1 and June 30th, 2004, we see that you know no one started using antipsychotic. However, from July 1, 2004 till 31st December, 2005 is the exposure period where in anyone who did not use uh, antipsychotic in the past six months, once they start, they get the index prescription, right? They, they have been exposed to that. Then you follow them up and see the in what outcome, maybe the same thing, metabolic uh, disorders, if they are developing, but you are not following them up. You are starting at a previous time point. You already have the data collected uh, uh, in, in different ways. And then you are analyzing them retrospectively to see how the treatment exposure was associated with the outcome that you're interested in. So this is in a nutshell about your retrospective cohort. So if you keep in mind this uh, uh, diagram, it will help you a lot to understand what's going on and how the two different type, the prospective and retrospective cohort uh, study designs differ. So as I said, all events, exposure, latent period and subsequent outcome, example, development of a disease or a condition, have already occurred in the past. In the past, use existing data. Example: the administrative claims database or electronic medical or health records to identify the study population and the exposure status. And the outcomes of interest or the disease state is determined at present time. As you move forward, you know you have let's say five years of data, and you were trying to see from year one to year four they were exposed and what happens after that. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so that's how you design your retrospective cohort studies. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of your retrospective cohort study? The advantages is that you can study multiple outcomes, which is pretty similar to your uh, uh, prospective cohort study. So with one drug, you can see many different outcomes. It's much less expensive compared to uh, prospective cohort study. It's not even comparable in many cases and it is much less time consuming. So this is very important. 
like it can be done are conducted very easily and very quickly. However, there are many different types of disadvantages associated with a uh, retrospective cohort study. There is a problem of selection bias and misclassification or information bias. And uh, later in my presentation, we will touch very briefly on selection bias. Then challenging to assess the temporal relationship because everything has happened in the past. You don't have any control to assess that temporal relationship. That's a big disadvantage. Uh, to rely on others for accurate record keeping. So the um, consistency of the data, the accuracy of the data is, can be questionable in certain uh, uh, situations. Difficulty comparing exposed versus non-exposed because can, there can be interchange between them and may require very large sample sizes for rare outcomes. That's another problem. Because if there are certain outcomes which are very rare, you need a very big sample size to uh, uh, see any type of differences that may even be there. Uh, this is an example of a, a retrospective cohort study, which was uh, from, uh, which is an original investigation. And you can refer to it later on. So basically it's looking into the serious fall injuries uh, before and after initiation of hemodialysis among older end stage renal disease patients in the United States, a retrospective cohort study. So I will encourage you guys to read through it and see you know, how they have designed it, what inferences they made and all those things. Now, the third and the last type of study design in this observational studies is case control study. And this is very uh, interesting, you know, because how this is uh, designed is very tricky. So the case control uh, studies initiated by selecting subjects based on diseases and no diseases. So this is where you are, you know, in the present. So you have a group of people who already have the disease and you are comparing them to a group of people who do not have the disease. Now, what do you do with them? You go back, all right, and see among the people who were diseased, how many of them were exposed to that treatment and how many were not. You do the same thing for people who, have, who don't, don't have the disease and uh, you know uh, whether they're exposed or they're not exposed. So this is like a huge deal. Like, so you are going back in time and see, but trying to find out who were exposed, who are not exposed. Uh, and uh, you already know who have the disease and who don't have the disease. So you have to re review those records in that way. Um, identify a group of subjects that have the disease cases and who do not have the disease are identified. And then assess the relationship between the risk factor and the disease by reviewing records retrospectively and compare risk exposure in each group. So that's how you really look into that. But case control studies, because of a lot of uh, you know, study design issues, uh, data availability, recall bias and all, they are not as popular as your prospective uh, cohort or the retrospective cohort studies uh, usually. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? Advantages good for studying rare conditions or diseases. So for example, if there is a very rare disease, it, it might make sense that you, know, you identify that group and compare them to uh, people who don't have the disease and then go back and see and review their records about who are having a particular exposure versus not having an exposure in the two groups. So that's very useful in those uh, ways. As the condition or disease state of interest has already occurred, this study requires less time. So it's less time consuming. Um, the, it has the flexibility of assessing multiple risk factors or exposures, um, the same as the previous two different study design and relatively less expensive, which is very important. However, as I mentioned before, we have a recall bias. So if you ask me what happened to me in terms of, you know, if I took a medication six months or one year back, I may not be able to tell you very accurately. So there is a problem with recalling that event. So that's what we call the recall bias. Uh, difficulty establishing temporal relationship. It is almost not possible, like, you know, how and what happened. And sometimes it's challenging to find a suitable group like if you have a rare disease condition, you have to compare it to something comparable. You cannot compare apples to oranges, right? So finding that particular good comparison group or control group can be very challenging sometimes. So these are the different um, advantages and disadvantages of your case control study design. And this is a very landmark 
uh, example published in the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, uh, about uh, you know smoking and lung cancer, carcinoma of the lung, preliminary report. So lung cancer rates were rising in London, and they suspected cause of uh, suspected the cause by coal fire fumes. So they identified the patients with suspected cancer and found that all patients who confirmed lung cancer were smokers. So smoking was perhaps the main factor uh, as, and those and all without cancer were not smokers. So that's why they said that, okay, it might not be the um, coal fire fumes, rather the smoking, which led to this kind of problem, right? So that the smoke, that's how they came up with the idea that, you know, that smoking and uh, lung cancer are associated. This is a very landmark study. So quick quiz question. What do you think is the biggest limitation associated with observational studies? Is it lack of randomization, lack of placebo control groups, lack of strict inclusion exclusion criteria or large, uh, lack of large uh, sample sizes? So in the interest of time, let me give you this answer. And if someone has already answered this correctly, kudos to if, uh, him or her. So it's basically the lack of randomization. Sorry. Many of them, many of them have written option D. D? Yeah, I mean, yeah. D is, so observation <laughs> study can yeah, have a, large a, a written, yeah, option A has also written. Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's fine. So, but thanks so much for participating. But yeah, lack of randomization is perhaps the biggest issue, limitation, because that's what differentiate between the uh, best evidence versus the second best evidence. So, so let's quickly compare and contrast between uh, randomized control trials and the RWE, random, uh, real world evidence. So sample size, you know, RCTs have less sample size, pragmatic, in the middle, observation has more. Duration, ran, uh, traditional RCTs are moderate. Pragmatic control trials takes much more time. Observationals are much lower in terms of uh, time or duration. In terms of cost, RCTs are kind of in the middle. That pragmatic trials, as I mentioned before, can be very expensive. Whereas observational studies are much cheaper to conduct. In terms of internal validity, RCTs, as you can uh, imagine, has the highest internal validity, right? Because of its randomization. And very close next, come, uh, second comes the pragmatic clinical trials and observational studies. They have much lower internal validity. However, it is completely the opposite when you look at external validity. RCTs are very restricted and cannot be generalized too much. Pragmatic control trial, again, best of the both world, does high internal as well as high external validity. Whereas observational studies are very generalizable because you are doing the conducting the study in the population. So that is something in a nutshell about the different types of studies that we conduct to generate real world evidence. Now the question is, okay, we have this evidence. How good or bad is it? So we need to do something of a risk of bias assessment. So in randomized control trial, we answered the question like efficacy, can it work? And we have this component of randomization, which I have been very much you know, uh, underscoring or focusing on. However, if you look at observational study, you look at effectiveness. So this is a very big difference between RCTs and observational study. So, so we answer the question, does it work? in the observational studies. And we do that in a non-randomized self-selected way, which introduces the risk of bias, right? Now, the question is, can we mitigate this bias, right? So let's first see what is a bias. So bias is defined as a risk of systematic error or deviation from the truth in results or inference. Yeah, good so morning. You, this is Dr. Uh, yeah okay so my bias is not random error that is it's not by chance and it threatens the validity so but the risk of bias is something that we need to mitigate 
And as I mentioned before, you know, the selection bias and confounding is perhaps one of the most important things we need to address in our real world evidence kind of studies or observational studies, right? So it is like, you know, remember the baseline characteristics which you measure at the very beginning of the study. So a person who is receiving antipsychotic may be systematically different from a person who is not receiving antipsychotic. So that is one of the reasons, and we don't know why they are receiving uh, or not yeah, receiving. Sandeepan, Dr. Sandeepan, again, that sound, can you please adjust? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm almost done. I will, I will uh, uh, sign off and join right back. And yeah, yeah. We should be done. Sorry about that. Uh, one second, one second. Yeah, we all said something. Thank okay, you. so thanks. Thanks for your patience. Um, so um, selection bias. So it's basically, you know, so what I was, was trying to say is we don't know for sure that why one person received or one group received antipsychotic and one group did not. So if we are comparing antipsychotic users versus non-users, and we see the difference in mortality or metabolic disorder, it is biased. There is a selection bias because they may be different in terms of their age, gender, race, ethnicity. So we need to address that selection bias to make the case that our study inference is very valid. There is strong evidence from our study. Now, this is like very high level overview of how we can control for bias and confounding in observational studies. So there are many different ways. Regression uh, analysis based approaches, propensity score based matching, uh, using propensity score as a covariate, stratification, instrumental variable, and Heckman sample selection met model. So these are some of the examples of how you, we can control bias and confounding in our randomized control, uh, real world evidence. So when you are reading certain research reports or studies, you, know, you can say, okay, if they have done all this kind of uh, uh, adjustments, to make sure that whatever evidence is now from it is very strong, right? So this is where it's very important. And then finally, there has been some guidelines and standards for real world evidence. So if you go through this uh, example, like standards and guidelines, uh, uh, for observational studies, quality is in the eye of the beholder or standardizing quality assessment of observational studies for decision making in healthcare. So you can understand like how and what is going on here, right? How, how to address all these things, what to include and what not to do in your uh, uh, observational studies. So this will give you an idea. And why do you need that? Because the stakeholders could require or enforce methodological standards or guidelines because they will not trust if your study has not properly addressed the risk of selection bias or different types of biases within them. Journal editors, you know, uh, when we go to submit our papers in certain big journals like BMJ or JAMA, the, it is a requirement to say that, okay, this particular aspect has been addressed in our study on this page. So sometimes, sometimes journals uh, ask for that. F funding agencies, but uh, can require to fund uh, opt in funding until you can demonstrate that your study is uh, designed well enough. People will not be, uh, be willing to fund your uh, studies. Uh, Center for Medicare or, uh, or the payers, you know, the third party payers can require to opt in claims data. So, okay, so these are all the different important things. Why are the guidelines and standards and why we need them for the real world evidence? 
yes, your real world evidence is very important, very useful, but we need to be very careful how we are interpreting them. If we need to pay very close attention to the study design, right? So in this way, we can uh, uh, address all these issues. So having said that, I am ready for questions and comments and thanks so much for your patience. Yeah, once again, Dr. Sandeepan, thank yeah, you. Please take your time. Yeah. And I know that this is kind of, you know, uh, maybe a kind of a new concept for you guys. I'm happy to, uh, you know, address any question or anything like that. So uh, please feel free to ask anything. Guys, you can write your questions in the chat box directly. And Preeta, you can address. Preeta, sir, we have can... a question. Yes, sir. Sir, sir we have a question you, uh, in our chat. Mm -hmm. uh, the question goes like, how does the strategy for a case control study differ from that of a cohort study? Um. Can you repeat that or what was that? Sorry. Sure, sir. Yeah. Has the strategy case differ from that of a study? So uh, I'm really sorry, but you were breaking up, but um, from, so the case way- Case study the, and cohort study. Yeah, uh, the people difference, asking yeah. the difference, yeah. Yeah, so the basic idea for case control study design yeah. is that, you know, you have a very rare outcome, very rare disease. So in that case, you know, you cannot really design a prospective cohort or a retrospective cohort study because it will need a very large sample size for them to develop and for us to interpret from there. So that's why we identify them and select an appropriate control group. And we go back in time and see who were exposed and who were not exposed in the disease group. And we do the same for the comparison group. And that's how it differs. For both prospective and retrospective cohort study, we are following them up. But in this case, we are going back in time after we identify the disease state. So there is a reverse uh, directionality in terms of time uh, line that happens between these two different study designs. Thank you, sir. Sure. So we have another question. What mm -hmm. is the best way to collect data from the rural areas of developing countries? Great question. Great question. So here is where, you know, the, um, so there needs to be some partnership between the researchers as well as the, uh, you know, the local government and the central government to make sure that we reach out to this kind of folks, right? And this is a very big issue, not only in developing countries, trust me, this is a very big issue in the United States as well, you know? So the focus sometimes can be, you know, uh, for example, what is happening in underserved rural areas? Are they getting proper care? How much do they have to drive to a nearest uh, center to get treatment? So what is needed to be done is like, you know, for researchers to have a passion for that kind of research and develop strategies. Like, you know, when you do the data collection, you need to make sure that you uh, address many different uh, aspects to it. So for example, uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, Dr. Abhijit Banerjee, right? So he, uh, his work was pretty much focused in the rural areas sometimes in certain cases. So we need to address those kind of things and go back, uh, uh, you know, um, go to those rural areas and make sure that we partner up with the local authorities um, and keep collecting data from them and see what kind of uh, treatment they're getting, what are their outcomes, how is their quality of life and how we can improve them. So that's a great question, but this is how we can address it. Thank you, sir. So we have sure. a whole lot of questions for you. Uh, we are going to email it to you because we are running short on time. So sure. um, if you so get time, please kindly answer. We have a small token of appreciation for you. Yeah. Sure, sir. Sure. 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 Sure.
Uh, give me a moment. Give me a moment. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. The network is a little bit unstable now. Let me know if my screen is visible. Yeah, it's starting. So this is for you. Thank you. It's very kind of you guys for to uh, invite me to this talk and you know taking the time and having the patience to listen to my area of research, so to speak. Um, I really appreciate it and thanks so much. And again, I congratulate each one of you to um, uh, be able to organize this great session online. So kudos to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I wish you Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye, sir. Bye-bye, sir.